Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative webinar. Many of us recently returned from a fantastic fifth international tracheostomy symposium that was held last month in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I think the patient and family session was a truly inspirational one. And thank you to all those of you who attended and presented during the scientific session as well. Uh, these Global Tracheostomy Collaborative webinars are sponsored by Medtronic and Smith's Medical. However, please note that all the speakers today are not funded by these two industries. Each speaker will provide their own disclosures before they present. Also um, note that you will not be able to ask questions during the, these presentations, but you are encouraged to write your questions into the questions section. Uh, feel free to include the name of the panelists you would like to address a question to. Uh, we'll answer your questions once all the panelists have finished their uh, presentations. Today we have Jennifer LeBlanc and her team members here, Alexis Truax, who is a wound care nurse, and Shauna Helen, a speech pathologist from University Health Network in Canada. We also have Dr. Teher Valika, who's a pediatric otolaryngologist from Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. And I believe he also works at Northwestern Medicine, Feinberg School of Medicine, and Stanley Mann Children's Research Institute. Uh, Linda Morris, one of our GTC member, will also be sharing her expertise. Um, she works as a director of nursing research and is an associate professor through the physical medicine and rehab and anesthesiology, anesthesiology at Northwestern um, University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. Uh, we also have Hina Narsi Prasla, who's a pediatric otolaryngology nurse practitioner at the Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. All of these wonderful clinicians from various corners of the world will be sharing their expertise in assessing and managing issues related to tracheostomy stoma. Although it might sound trivial when compared to bleeding from the airway or loss of airway, tracheostomy-related pressure ulcers can actually affect patients' quality of life. And these device-related pressure ulcers or injuries are actually reportable in many countries and tend to have a huge economic impact for both patients and providers. So let's hear from our first team, our multidisciplinary group of speakers, Jennifer LeBlanc, Alexis Truax, and Shauna Helen. Uh, Jennifer, please take it away from here. Hi, thanks so much. Um, and welcome. So um, as Vincia mentioned, uh, we're the interprofessional tracheostomy team at the Toronto Western Hospital, so part of the University Health Network up here in Toronto. Uh, I'm Jennifer. I'm a respiratory therapist. This is Alexis, our wound and ostomy nurse, and Shauna, who's our speech language pathologist. And we're going to just speak a little bit about our interprofessional approach to um, tracheostomy stoma assessments here at the Toronto Western Hospital. Okay, so the first tracheostomy team in Canada was actually started here at Toronto Western Hospital. And the concept initially came about in 1992 when a respiratory therapist, an SLP, and an RN met to establish um, and discuss goals for trach patients, including improving their quality of life and facilitating weaning, preventing wounds and pressure injuries. And by 1998, the trach team here was fully established. Around 2015, this same trach team model was also adopted at one of our complex continuing care sites that's affiliated with the University Health Network, where they care for around 60 trach patients. Um, and the role of our team has evolved from its inception from a trach police team to more of a consultative and collaborative team approach. So the benefits of the team approach um, we ensure appropriate and safe trait care, so we're looking to minimize risk, reduce complications, and ensuring that hospital policies reflect best practices and current practices. Uh, we provide education not only to patients and families, but also to bedside nurses, uh, various different learners, so physicians, residents, fellows, new hires in all disciplines and students across all disciplines. We also bring forward our own expertise, so we're looking to improve patients' quality of life using this multidisciplinary approach, so facilitating their communication, eating and drinking, weaning, pain management, comfort, et cetera. 
And together, we can recognize trends and the types of complications and risk factors that we commonly see, and then we're able to implement changes. So for example, bringing in specialized dressings to deal with certain issues that we're seeing at the time. So our team members here, uh, we are the core team. So we have the three of us, an SLP, RT, an RN that's specialized in wound and ostomy care. We have also an attending physician, the one of the rotating attending physicians in the ICU that will join us. And we frequently consult other services. So you can see the list there, but for example, we consult dietitians who can change nutrition formulas and supplementation to optimize wound healing, um, ENTs, OT or PTs, social work, spiritual care, um, surgical services, and then we also have an SLP volunteer services program, and they can provide social visits for patients to engage them in conversation or any preferred activities. So our process here um, is that first there's a preliminary trach audit that is performed once a week by the RT. Um, obviously routine trach care by the RT and the bedside nurse is being performed all the time, but once a week the RT does a more in-depth trach audit. Um, then the three of us, along with the physician, come around once a week to do weekly bedside consultations. So we do go to the bedside of every trach patient at our institution. During these bedside consultations, we document our findings and we make any recommendations um, that we see fit. So these recommendations include um, weaning, they may include trach changes to different sizes or different types. Um, we make recommendations for communication and swallowing, wound care interventions, and then referrals to any of those services that Shauna just mentioned. As she also alluded to, we invite any students of any profession to come with us for our bedside consultation rounds. Um, and during these rounds, during our documentation, we do also do some data collection um, and use that data for further analysis. Just to show you an example, this is actually the documentation form that we use when we do our bedside consultation. Um, so we document some of our preliminary um, information around the trach size and type. Um, we assess the stoma ourselves and document that, and then all of our recommendations and plans. This documentation form has really assisted us for the last couple of years of becoming a more efficient team. Um, obviously, the check marks have made us um, more timely in our rounds. Um, it also allows us to have a standardized documentation form so that for each patient, um, especially when it comes to our stoma assessments, that we're documenting in a standardized way um, from week to week and so that we can really see progression or degression of our stoma each week. Um, we use this form to help our patients meet their goals um, and it also lives at, as that living document in our patient's chart. So this is Alexis. I'm going to be reviewing our standard principles for stoma assessment. It's really important to us that the skin under the flange and the ties are all visualized. So that means we go in and we manipulate them so that we can see all of the skin underneath the flange and the ties. And we've taught all of our team members at bedside to do the same thing. We look at the stoma itself. The perfect stoma has skin that goes right up to the edge of the tube and there's minimal or no gaps and there's no extra tissue uh, extruding up above. We look for any moisture or drainage, and if there's any, we try to identify the source and the type, for instance, that may be wound exudate versus uh, mucus that's coming from the respiratory tract. We do a pain assessment using nonverbal pain scales if necessary. And ideally, there's no pain, but it really helps us to know if the pain is localized to a certain area. For instance, is there a stitch that may be bothering them or um, somewhere that's bleeding? We also want to assess any device that comes in contact with the skin, so that includes any accessories attached to or supplementing the tracheostomy tube. That's trach ties, oxygen, or humidity tubing and masks. And we're also looking for any redness, any erythema, rash, any debris that may be there causing irritation, and as well as any breaks in skin integrity, such as pressure injuries or incisions. So there's currently no validated risk assessment tool for tracheostomy, and we have identified some risk factors during past assessments that we've incorporated into our um, assessments. These include and are not limited to the anatomy and positioning of the device and in the head and the neck. For instance, if the head is in an interior tilt, it pushes the entire device downwards, increasing pressure on the inferior side, which increases risk of pressure. Excessive moisture from secretions or humidity, if there is a difficult insertion, or if the tracheostomy is surgically placed rather than percutaneously placed. 
if there are patients using a cervical stabilization collar, which reduces the ability for us to do a comprehensive casual assessment. And then if there's any delay in the suture removal, we standardly have our trach sutured in place and we have a protocol and a medical directive to re remove them. But if there's anything that happens that makes the suture stay in longer, that increases the risk. Now, this is a photo of one of our patients who had a pressure injury from a stay suture. So that's those two darker lines coming off from the stoma edge. Now, you can see that it's redness or erythematous in the center, and those there's a grouping of linear skin breakdowns extending from the stoma edge out into the skin. And that's actually from those stay sutures being pressed into the skin with uh, acute pressure from the flange. And there was a cervical collar on that was also pushing it in. And it reduced our ability to do uh, more casual assessments. So device-related pressure injuries, the National Pressure Injury Advisory Panel defines the pressure injury as localized damage to the skin and the underlying soft tissue, usually over a bony prominence or related to a medical or other device. And for us, it's always related to the tracheostomy, either the flange or the tubing itself, or from the trach ties or any accessories that are attached. Now, when the device is the source of pressure and it's a life-sustaining device, you can't take away that source of pressure. So instead, we identify the risks and we provide pressure redistribution strategies to minimize that risk to help hopefully prevent the injuries. Now, most of our patients don't actually need to have routine pressure redistribution implemented, but we use the risk factors that we've identified in our practice and use those risk factors to identify patients that we think may be at risk and do our interventions. So we use a specialty foam tracheostomy dressing, which is the one kind of in the center of your screen there. And it's um, a softer foam and it fits underneath the flange and it helps to minimize the amount of movement around the trach just by supporting from between the skin and the flange. And it also redistributes pressure so that instead of having a focused spot over a bony prominence or related to the device, it's more diffuse and spread out. Now for dry stomas, we use that silicone pad that's kind of up in the upper right there. And that again fits between the flange and the skin and it, thank you, and it helps to um, redistribute, and it kind of helps to float the flange as well. Now, surgical site infections are actually less um, common for us. They're typically when there's a larger incision that requires suturing to close, and we treat those using the principles of wound healing um, as they are a wound, so we debride any devitalized tissue or necrotic tissue, we manage moisture, and we treat bacteria. And hypergranulation is our most common abnormal finding for stomas. It's extra tissue that's growing above the skin edge, and it can make quite a bit of moisture. It can also bleed. Most of the time, it's benign, but it can be an indicator of other issues, such as needing more tube stabilization, too much moisture, or the presence of a biofilm or bacterial colonization. Now, for stoma management, we follow these four M's of tube maintenance. We want to minimize the amount of movement of the tube. So when patients breathe, chop, uh, cough, or chew, and even sometimes with their heartbeat, you can see the tube moving a little bit. And though the tube sometimes does have a balloon on the inside, that is not securement. We use a trach ties, which is a secondary securement. You can also use that device between the flange and the skin to support the tube to minimize these micro movements, such as the foam or the silicone pad. Now, moisture can also be a really significant issue. It affects the microclimate of the skin, interfering with the natural barrier of the skin and leaving it at an increased risk of skin breakdown. We, <clears throat> pardon me, we need to consider where that moisture is coming from because you need to treat the cause and eliminate it in order to be most effective. But you can treat the symptom of the moisture by using a moisture wicking product, such as an open cell foam. It'll help wick with the moisture away and evaporate into the environment. Now, bacteria is always present on our skin. And it's not always an issue, but when it does become an issue, um, it's usually because it's formed a biofilm and it attaches to the tube or into the necrotic tissue around any wounds. So you, um, you can treat that using um, wound healing principles, like using an antimicrobial dressing or debridement. And if there is a wound uh, present, we use the principles of moist wound healing and we use Paradigm. So we use advanced wound care products as appropriate to maintain the appropriate moisture balance. And an easy way that we remember how much moisture we need and that I teach with is to say, not too wet, not too dry, just like the moisture in your eye. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, Alexis, and Shauna for talking about uh, your multidisciplinary approach to identifying wound-related or trach-related wound issues and how you figure out um, what type of dressing or what type of um, 
antibacterial or antimicrobial um, devices that you need. Um, at this time, I'm going to uh, request Dr. Teher Valika to talk about um, approach, an approach that he's actually used to try and decrease the number of uh, cases that are misdiagnosed is probably the right way to say. I'll actually let, let him explain it himself. <laughs> no, that was perfect. So I want to thank everyone for joining us and taking time out of their day or night um, to come in and listen to our little topic about this. Um, so what I want, I want to talk about today is reducing wound breakdown through photography. Um, So when we look at tracheostomy-related pressure ulcers, um, as we mentioned earlier, you know, they're quite difficult to manage. It's why we're all here today to try to identify, you know, what we can do to make these outcomes better for these situations. Um, the pressure ulcers are quite difficult to manage. They affect quality of life, and it's quality of life of the patient itself, as well as the families taking part. Um, they can also affect hospitalization. So families who come in can prolong their hospital stay after a tracheostomy or for having a new tracheostomy and come in for a secondary complication. And I think one of the important factors in certain countries, as we've understood, is that it also affects your reimbursement. So this can be quite challenging in terms of patient care and, you know, making sure we do the right thing for the right patient. The reason we're all here today is because clearly there's no perfect formula to prevent these pressure ulcers. You know, there's plenty of studies out there that have modified whether it's dressings, whether it's having, you know, separate um, ties underneath the trach or the trach tube itself. Um, I know people have along the way come and improved their wound care rates and prevention of these ulcers, but there hasn't, there's no perfect formula just yet. I wanted to briefly go through the wound breakdown staging um, just because I think this is relevant to why this is such an important topic. So when you have a stage one or a stage two ulcer, this is where you speak of the superficial skin breakdown or just the overlying skin that's broken down. When you have a stage three or stage four wound breakdown, this is where you have the fat visible, as we can see in the bottom left-hand picture, as well as muscle or bone exposure. And the reason this is really important is not just for improved patient care with these situations, but truly because um, in this day and age, especially in the United States, um, and for the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, um, you actually don't get reimbursed if you're post-surgical patients develop these wound breakdowns. And mind you, these are complicated patients requiring complicated time and expertise, and it's unfortunate when that were to happen. And as these are considered unnecessary procedure complications in the eyes of U.S. News World Report and other agencies, um, you can potentially lose your ranking for the hospital system. So I think it's very important to make sure that we can do everything we can in the power to prevent this. So this is an example of a patient that we got for a consultation um, from the neonatal ICU for concern for wound breakdown. They had classified this as a stage three, four breakdown. They pointed to the overlying muscle that was exposed around the stoma, as well as some of the fat that was coming out. And this picture I want you guys to just look at, sort of, sort of remember for a little bit later in the presentation, and we'll come back and talk about it. So the big idea is why, the, why did I even think of this or how did this sort of come about? Um, in our system, once the ENTs have done the surgery, we follow the patients for the first several, for the first week, and then it, we sort of hand them off to the neonatal ICU, the critical care teams, and the general medicine teams who are following these patients for the long run. We see the patients either once a week or once every other week. Unfortunately, um, in the absence of the surgical team making an input, um, a lot of people will make the diagnosis or be concerned for a wound breakdown diagnosis and go on to the next step of formulating, stating that this is a wound breakdown. Many times I would not even be aware my patients were having concerns for wound breakdown or there was wound breakdown. Um, and that's where this sort of stems. It's in the eye of the beholder, right? We look at the patient, and what I see as a surgeon may not be necessarily what a nursing staff sees or a critical care member's team sees or the general medical team sees. So how do we get the eye of the beholder question out of the picture? Basically, by taking pictures. <laughs> So what we decided to do is we wanted to obtain an intraoperative picture that we would upload directly into our uh, medical record system for all to access and compare. So now everybody could see what you could see. So what we did is on our sign outs, we would show the nursing staff where the picture was, what the wound would look like, what we expected the wound to look like, and take it from there. 
So what do we see? So, so far we've had nine months of preliminary data and it actually all looks really interesting. Prior to taking the pictures, we had 21 patients who had a tracheostomy placed. And of those, 17 patients were concerned for their stage three or four breakdown. After taking these pictures, having um, discussions with the staff, this amount of diagnoses that we had reduced to almost only 10%. And both these patients who had this breakdown diagnosis were stage one ulcers underneath the flange itself. So if you remember that first picture that I showed you guys, um, this is the same picture that we looked at. So a picture that we had been earlier classified as stage three or four breakdown was unbeknownst to others that this was actually a post-op day zero picture. This is what a tracheostomy fresh wound looks like intraoperatively. Um, you can see the stay sutures. You can see the surrounding muscle that you would expect while dissecting the trachea. You can see the fat that is expected from coming out from underneath the skin. Um, and you can see exactly what the stoma is supposed to look like right away. And what this further led us to was making education, because I think that's the biggest thing, which we're all here for today as well, is understanding that to make sure that everybody sees what I see as the individual responsible for doing the surgery, is making sure that we have an open discussion and collaboration with our team. So this actually culminated in us having multiple lectures across the several ICU care units, including the neonatal ICU, the cardiac ICU, pediatric ICU, and to other pediatric uh, and pediatrician practices around our area to really discuss you know, what we're looking at, what are our new initiatives, and how we can collaborate to decide and discuss these wound breakdown issues and see if that truly makes a difference in the overall patient care, because that's what we're here for at the end of the day. I wanna mention the maturation stitches. I know we've all seen these and it's more common in the pediatric population than in the adult population. This was something that always uh, really busted us. Um, people would look at this little divot that's in the front of the stoma and say, look, there's a wound breakdown or you have a hole there. This suture is classically thrown with a chromic gut suture, which is a very reactive to superficial skin. Um, and just by having a discussion with family members, the nursing staff, the attending physicians, and explains to them that this is you know, a key portion of the surgery, that this is supposed to be expected to be swollen, uh, really helped us manage our wound breakdown. I know some hospitals have a paper handout sheet or a virtual handout sheet that sits in the medical record system where you can you know, identify the tracheostomy details, the airway plan, what to do in case of emergency. What we did to help ourselves is in addition to having the airway plan and the trach details, we also added the wound care directly onto the sheet. So if you look at the tab at the bottom, you know, we made sure that the ENTs ourselves are not left out of the discussion plan if there's wound issues. And then if there's any concerns for wound breakdown, please see the media tab. So we allowed a reference point for these families to say, you know, come and look at this site. We have a picture of what it's supposed to look like. How is this wound evolving? How is this wound changing? Is it changing for the better or changing for the worse? So what did we learn? I like to say, you know, my five-year-old taught me this, something he just learned in his kindergarten class, which is the KISS method, which is the keep it simple method, right? This may seem like a very novel idea. You know, we're all trained professionals. We know what these things are supposed to look like, but I think many times we take this for granted. And, you know, what I see may not be what you see. So even though it may just be simply as taking a picture, I think having that with teamwork and communication um, has really helped for the betterness of our families, betterness for our patients, and just the overall changing of our wound breakdown issues. Thank you. Thank you, Teher. I think that was really eye-opening uh, to hear uh, the differences in what a surgeon perceives and uh, what the other providers at the bedside perceive in terms of the staging of the wound. Um, I really love your idea of taking pictures and saving them in medical records so that all the other care providers can refer to that. And it's also really, um, I'm really excited to hear that a surgeon is really passionate about the wound care and the aftermath because I think a lot of times in hospitals you hear, you don't get to get or you don't get connected back with the surgeon who did the procedure 
um, because the patient is in a different hospital, a different setting, and then we're still dealing with the wound at a later stage. So this is really helpful to hear um, that taking that picture really helps stage that wound more effectively and efficiently. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. At this time, I'm going to request Linda Morris to talk about uh, an innovative approach to changing dressing. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Um, well, I can't see everybody, but <laughs> it's great to be here. It's great to be seen. How's that? Um, first of all, I, um, I'm going to be talking about this new method of dressing changes. We um, used a new device that was developed by two critical care nurses to improve compliance with dressing changes with tracheostomies. Um, by way of disclosures, um, we have a book out on trachs. Um, by the way, this book is actually out of print right now, but we are working on a second edition. Hopefully it will be out early 2020. Um, I also do some legal consulting, some of which involves trachs. Um, I also wanted to brag for just a moment about the place that I work. I work at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, which is formerly known as the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. Um, we opened a brand new building in 2017. Um, it's 27 stories, over a million square feet, and we've got all kinds of all kinds of new therapies, research going on. We have um, a hydrotherapy pool. We have MRI and CT scanning. Um, it's, it's really a great place to work. It's in the uh, slide shows. It's where we are located in the heart of downtown Chicago. We're only one block away from Lakeshore Drive. You can see uh, the Ferris wheel at Navy Pier to the left. Um, and I also want to mention, as we are a rehab hospital, uh, acute um, inpatient rehab facility, and so we get a lot of patients with trachs coming to us. We have, um, at any point in time, we have up to 15% of our entire census of patients have a trach. So we're very invested in trach care here. Um, and this study began with, as I said, it was invented by two critical care nurses from the uh, Chicago suburbs, actually. Um, and they created this device to help with dressing changes. Um, sometimes it's difficult to get your fingers underneath, underneath there, um, and it can be magnified when patients have cervical collars, if they have beards, or they're short or thick necks. Um, and so when I make trach rounds, that's one of the things that I notice is I take the dressing off and I see it's, you know, frequently the dressings haven't been changed as often as they probably should be. Um, and so if there's a device that can help us do that, um, I was very interested in that. So I met these two nurses at a magnet conference. They told me about the product that they had developed and patented, and I wanted to be a part of testing that. So I took it back to our um, group, our, our multidisciplinary group we call the Trick Champions. They're a group of nurses, uh, respiratory therapists, PT, OT, speech, um, and physicians as well, and um, they are representatives from each area of the hospital, and many of them have gone through the um, city training, the research training for protection of human subjects, and so we have um, the TRAIC champions as being the leaders and implementers of the, the uh, TDA study on their units. So they were the ones who enrolled patients, collected surveys. The TDA is a, it looks like a little plastic fork. And you can see that you use the, use a, a drain sponge and open it up, put the TDA in between the drain sponge and then slide it under the neck flange. And the video on the next slide shows you just how easy it is. Today we're going to demonstrate the use of the tracheostomy dressing applicator, also called the TDA. You'll see we have a mannequin here with a tracheostomy and a dressing in place. 
In order to do trachea, we're going to remove the soil dressing. We want you to perform tracheostomy care per your hospital or facility protocol. When reapplying the dressing, you'll be using a split gauze. Notice that the split gauze here is bifold. You will be placing the TDA between the layers of the dressing, noticing that it has a thumb groove here. The purpose of the thumb groove is when you put the dressing over the TDA, you'll need to pull the dressing taut so that you have complete control over the dressing. Next, we'll come over to the tracheostomy and we'll slide the dressing underneath the trach plate, ensuring that the two folds of the dressing are above the trach plate. Remove the tracheostomy dressing applicator, adjust the dressing as necessary, and your trach here is complete. Pretty nifty, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, we did a study to evaluate the effectiveness and the safety of the TDA. We had 19 patients consented, 13 males and six females, and we also consented 117 nurses. Our IRB wanted the nurses to be uh, considered research subjects as well because they were going to be completing a survey after each dressing change. So when the nurses consented, they agreed to change the dressing twice during their shift, once using the TDA and once using the standard method. They were randomly assigned into one of two groups. Group A did the first dressing change without the TDA and the second dressing change with the TDA. And group B did it the opposite way. First dressing change was with the TDA and the second was without the TDA using the standard method. So they completed a survey after each dressing change asking about the ease of dressing change and any discomfort that they noticed. And they also asked the patients a question about how comfortable was the dressing change or did you have any discomfort? And so our results were, um, we got 209 surveys returned. Most of the dressing changes occurred between seven and 9 a.m or 2 to 5 p.m. Um, patient age ranged between 18 to 85 with a mean of 37 years. And by the way, we um, limited the TDA use to patients 16 and over. Um, we do have a lot of pediatric patients here, but we wanted to, the TDA is approved only for adults at this time. Um, the frequency, uh, we got 143 male surveys back and 66 female surveys. And we also asked a question about the neck size. We didn't measure BMI or we didn't measure the neck size. We just asked the nurses to um, give an estimate of the, or their, their, uh, uh, their assessment of the neck size. So we got 129 normal necks, 71 necks that were, that were considered thick or short and eight that were considered morbidly obese. And for statistical purposes, we combined the latter two groups. So um, because the morbidly obese group was just too small to really analyze. Our results showed that the TDA uh, made this dressing changes significantly easier, especially for patients with a normal neck size. Um, for the overall degree of perceived discomfort. We had the TDA lessen perceived discomfort, and this was the question asking the patient about their discomfort. Um, the TDA lessened the perceived discomfort regardless of next, next size. And the patient reported discomfort, we had less patients who were able to answer the question because we do have some patients who are not cognitively intact, but we did have about half of the number reporting that the discomfort varied between none and mild, regardless of the neck size or method of dressing change. So one thing that I also wanna point out is that the TDA had um, use of the TDA during our study and it took us about three months to complete the study. Um, an important thing to mention is that 
there were no adverse events at all with use of the TDA. No decannulations, no tube dislodgements. I know people were kind of concerned about that. No skin issues, and it was an easy and safe device to use. Thank you, Linda, for sharing about this new device. I'm sure a lot of folks would be interested, especially those who are um, designated to be the ones to do these regular uh, dressing changes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, next, <laughs> next, I'm going to request um, Hina Prasla, who's a, a nurse practitioner, to share about um, her expertise in managing stoma granulomas. Hi everyone, my name is Hina Narsi Prasla and I'm an ENT nurse practitioner at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas, United States. And I'm going to review how we've improved the tracheostomy granulation management and outcomes at our institution. So pediatric trachs can be associated with various postoperative complications that can be divided into early and late complications, which can increase the patient's medical stay, as well as the costs associated with the care, as we discussed earlier in the presentation. So a lot of these complications can occur within the first seven days post-operative, which the most common are going to be pneumomediastinum and pneumothorax. Late complications can arise during the later part of the patient's stay, as well as in the outpatient setting, with the increase in comorbidity of chronically ill trach patients, long-term complications may not be brought to light until a sentinel event does end up occurring. So peristomal granulation tissue is a common late complication of trach placement, and it has an incidence of up to 40%. Literature has suggested that maturing the stoma intraoperatively does not necessarily decrease the rate of peristomal granulation tissue, but this complication can lead to bleeding to the stoma site, obstruction during trach tube replacement, as well as an increase in medical costs in order to treat the complication. So Texas Children's Hospital is a tertiary hospital located in Houston, Texas, USA, and we have the largest pediatric otolaryngology department in the nation and we perform an average of about 80 to 90 tracheostomies a year. We launched our weekly multidisciplinary rounds in November of 2014, in which every patient with a trach that's admitted is seen by an advanced practice provider and formally presented during our multidisciplinary trach rounds. Through our rounds, we identify early and late post-operative complications and concerns including but not limited to appropriate trach size and length, granulation tissue, skin breakdown, bleeding, infection, tube obstruction, accidental decannulation, swallowing, and voicing. We did find that granulation tissue was frequently seen as a late postoperative complication, and we found a variety of treatment modalities that have been historically used at our institutions have included steroid cream application, steroid drops, silver nitrate cautery, silvidine cream, cifridex drops, and in severe cases, surgical excision. So we did do a study in 2017, and this was presented at the ITS in um, Dallas. And so I wanted to go over some of the things that we had discussed at that time. And so the objective um, for the study was to evaluate the efficacy of various topical treatment modalities that are being used at our institution to reduce the granulation tissue, and even to determine which modality we wanted to adopt long term. So we did a retrospective review of trachs placed at Texas Children's Hospital between May 2015 to May 2017. And of the 165 patients reviewed, 90 were found to have peristomal granulomas. And these patients were treated with a variety of treatment modalities. So we broke it down into categories with those that were treated with Cipridex otic drops to the stoma site BID with the treatment duration varying from 7 to 14 days, Cipridex otic drops in combination with silver nitrate sticks, as well as silver nitrate sticks 
being used alone and application ranged anywhere between one to five applications as well as Mepilex AG or Mepilex Silver 4x4 dressing with the duration of application being one to two weeks. The only treatment that was physically done by the ENT advanced practice provider was the silver nitrate and all other modalities were administered by the bedside nursing in the ICU setting. So the granuloma size was noted before and after the various topical treatment modalities and it was identified as partial or complete resolution. So of the 90 patients, 12 were treated with Ciprodex alone and 42% showed complete resolution. 13 patients were treated with Ciprodex in conjunction with silver nitrate, as you can see here, and 38% showed complete resolution. 48 patients were treated with silver nitrate. And I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. 42 had shown complete resolution. 13 patients were treated with Mepilex AG foam dressing and 54% showed complete resolution. Four of our patients did not receive any intervention and 50% had spontaneous resolution. So there was no statistical significance between any of the treatment modalities and resolution of the peristomal granulation tissue. But we can see a breakdown of pros and cons of each of the various modalities, including pain and discomfort, traveling to a specialist in order to receive the treatment modality, cost, prescription requirement, as well as application duration. So all of the modalities had similar efficacy in managing the granulomas. Those Ciprodex and silver nitrate were successful at managing the granulomas. They also accompany adverse effects such as discomfort and pain, along with medical costs. The retail price in the United States for a bottle of Ciprodex is almost $250. And the cost of silver nitrate is 66 for a canister of silver nitrate, but you also have to remember the copay to visit the specialist would be another cost that's incurred. Mepilex AG or Mepilex Silver not only provides a foam barrier dressing, because it's impregnated with silver, which has antimicrobial properties, as well as anti-inflammatory benefits. And this can be an attractive option from a price perspective because the average cost of one dressing is $8. And the dressing can be left into place for up to five days per the manufacturer. And it can be applied by the parents or the caregivers without a medical prescription. So again, Mepilex Silver is an attractive option for both bedside nurses and outpatient caregivers as it doesn't require administration or application of topical medicine, nor does it require a visit to the specialist. Limitations to our study were its retrospective nature, the sample size, because it was only the patients that were fresh trachs, so first-time admissions were the ones that were evaluated. We didn't have a standardized nomenclature or classification system for describing the somal granulation tissue, as well as documented, documenting style of the providers when describing the granuloma tissue size really varied. So these are examples of our actual patients that are currently admitted at Texas Children's Hospital who we are treating with the various treatment modalities for the granulation tissue at the stoma site. So in this small study, all of the commonly used treatment methods were equally effective just about at reducing granuloma size. And again, each treatment modality had its pros and cons. We're still collecting data at our institution on our patients with granulation tissue and until more definitive data exists, the institutions, practitioners can feel comfortable using whatever is the most convenient option in their practice and for the patient. So we're planning on completing the study at the end of the year and eventually we'll decide which modality works best for our institution so we can adopt a long-term treatment option for all of them. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Hina. Uh, that was wonderful to hear um, the various modalities that you used and 
to find out which one works best for certain population. Um, as a follow-up to that, I actually wanted to um, ask a question to Tehar, since you are in the role of a surgeon. Um, I'm wondering if you could share some insight as to what you would do for your patients when they develop stomal granulomas. So it is variable, and I agree with what Hina mentioned. You know, I think it is just out of customary practice of what we've sort of trained with and what we sort of pass along that culture to our trainees and going on forward. It was very interesting to see this data because the only thing I haven't used is Methylex AG. Um, and, you know, looking at what Hina's presenting, it kind of makes me think because I'm in that boat where if it's not causing a problem, I don't like to fix those problems because I really can't explain why I'm doing a necessary procedure, and I don't think it's helpful or nice to the families to do such things. Um, my go-to method has really been is trying to really modify the stoma. Ciprodex works well, and if it's if it's bleeding a lot, then I go with the silver nitrate. But my goal has really been Ciprodex or silver nitrate. What I've done to sort of actually buffer the cost because Ciprodex is so expensive is just give it as two separate medications, as the Ciprodex and the Dexamethasone Odic. And I think the cost for that comes out to be approximately 11 or $12 um, if you mix the two separate medications that giving the Ciprodex as a whole together. Thank you, Tehar. Um, does anyone else want to chime in in terms of management of granulomas? Hi, it's Alexis. Uh, we actually practice in a way for granulations where we try to identify the cause because granulations will always come back if there's a cause because it's a pathological growth of the granulation tissue. And if you don't uh, identify what's causing it, things like um, anti-inflammatories or treating it with silver nitrate uh, just cause it to go away for a little while and then it comes back again. So this comes down to the conversation of how troublesome is it? Like, is it large enough that it can cause like a ball valve effect when you're changing it, which is probably the most important reason why we would treat granulations is it for the risk of the airway. But if it's really important to somebody that they have minimal scars after the tracheostomy comes out, or it's something that the family's really focusing on, we'll look at um, maybe doing a short course of the Ciprodex, which we in the Canadian healthcare system are in hospital is always paid for by our public healthcare system. So we don't think about the cost the way that our American colleagues would. Uh, but we know that because uh, anti-inflammatories or the steroid isn't going to stop the reason that you have the granulation, it just does the superficial uh, uh, stopping it right away and then it comes back later. And the same with um, silver nitrate. We very rarely use silver nitrate on our granulations unless it's bleeding to a point where it's causing distress or it's dangerous. Um, simply because silver nitrate actually can be pro-inflammatory in some cases, which causes the granulation to come back. And we also find that if you don't do a serial silver nitrate, and for us, the most effective one is to do it like two or three times in a week, so say a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And if you do that, you may have a really good effect on your granulation. But other than that, if you just do it once and then two weeks later, somebody else does it, and then a month later, somebody else does it, it doesn't really have the effect. So we really focus on like, is it movement? Is it moisture? Is it a biofilm? We look at treating those, and if that doesn't fix it, then we look for the more surgical options. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. And also, thank you for highlighting the differences in the healthcare system and how that plays a role into the selection of your treatment modalities. Uh, there is a question here from our um, listeners. Uh, they were wondering if the documentation sheet that you use for assessing the stoma, if that's available for use. Um, and then um, one here. Yeah, sorry, I guess we just made it up, so, um, and it works for us. I, actually, the key point for us is we print it out on a sticker. So, yeah, we just check mark, um, we kind of pre-fill in as much as we can, do the rest at the bedside, and then we stick it right um, in our chart. Unfortunately, we're still paper charting here. Um, hopefully, in the next couple of years, we're going to elect. <laughs> But um, that's what's really expedited our process at the bedside. So um, I can send it if someone wants to contact us. I'm happy to send it along. Um, it is something we also are t we take a look at regularly and have made updates to it. Um, you know, we used to write out the stoma findings and we kind of added the picture. So it is something we're kind of constantly looking at updating as well. But I'm happy to pass on that version to anyone who's interested. Wonderful. So if you, whoever asked that question, if you can send an email to the GTC. Um, we also have Jennifer's email on, on, a, uh, on the upcoming slide. Uh, we'll definitely uh, get in touch with her and get the document for you. 
A follow-up question they have is, how do you assess cough strength? Um, I think they found that on your documentation form. Yeah, um, it's really a subjective measure. So it's the bedside RT, the bedside nurse NS would um, just, yeah, that's a little bit of a subjective measure that we do um, just based on what we're um, seeing right at the bedside, what they do. So we, I don't know if you could see when we went through it, but we do judge whether it's spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So if their cough is only triggered when we're suctioning, they're obviously not going to clear their secretions um, on a constant basis. Um, so we look at that a lot, kind of the non-spontaneous to spontaneous cough, and then the strength um, is subjective to us, whether we think it's strong enough that they're going to be able to clear their secretions on their own if we stop suctioning or if we start corking, for example, um, or whether their cough is just too weak um, to be able to clear their secretions. We work at a, our site is very um, neuro-specialized and spinal cord injury, so we do see this a lot. So I think as bedside clinicians, we've come a bit accustomed to speaking about cough strength because we see a lot of um, patients, unfortunately, with really weak cough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is a question. I think this is a person who apologizes that they missed the first few minutes. The question is, what type of dressings um, do or placement of dressing method do you use when sutures are in place? Um, and if um, suture is in place, what suture locations do most of the providers use? All four, top, bottom, etc. I wonder if Taher, since you're probably the one dealing with fresh stomas. Yeah, um, so it varies amongst our, amongst our practice providers. We have 12 other EMTs in our group that do tracheostomies. Um, and being in Chicago, I think we probably do 100, 150 trachs easy in one year. Um, amongst us, we've sort of changed over where we put the maturation sutures for the stoma. So there's usually that four point suture that people place. As I've evolved my practice, I think I've adjusted to putting a simple single stitch at the inferior aspect. And what I do is a simple half mattress from the left of the wound through the trachea to the right of the wound. And what that does, it closes off the deep space on the inferior edge only, thereby limiting any increase of chance of having a false passage. Um, I personally I do not put a dressing on unless I think it's necessary. So depending on what the stoma looks like, if there's secretions, I will put a dressing that's going to be absorbent. If it looks like there's going to be, you know, secretions plus an infection, then I put an absorbent with an antibacterial. If we're looking for purely for secretion management and trying to absorb the secretions, then I go with like a Zorbex kind of dressing to help absorb the dressing and keep it so that the wound itself doesn't stay wet. What we had a common issue with earlier was a lot of people love to put gauze underneath and the gauze covers up the wound and it soaks up the dress secretions. But what we realized is that the gauze is not uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic layers. Mm -hmm. So what it was doing is soaking up the wound, but keeping the wound moist and having a wet wound underneath the flange was only increasing or exacerbating the wound breakdown. So I've tried to push more and more and convince our families and our nursing units to get over this, that we need to have a dressing in place and to really identify each of the decisions you make, why are you making this decision um, to help better identify. But I think any dressing, even with the stay sutures or the maturation stitch, can be tolerated underneath the tracheostomy stoma without an issue, or underneath the flange, I apologize. Thank you, Tehar. Anyone else want to chime in? Uh, sure, we'd love to. One of the things that we found with the way we round is because we bring the physicians that place the percutaneous trachs with us, we're able to, in the moment, say, oh, what happened when this went in? Why did you make this choice, et cetera, et cetera? And um, for historical reasons, we do the four suture sites on the outside. We very rarely do the mattressing or the stay suture. Um, but if you have the four on the outside, so through that, we were able to give feedback in the moment to the different positions that are putting the tubes in. And from that, they've actually changed the way they add the sutures. So they put them in slightly looser, or maybe they'll say, oh, the clavicles are very, very close here, so I'll only put one in up here or maybe two in up here so that you can get something underneath to help redistribute the pressure. So very typically, for the first couple of days, we do no dressing whatsoever unless there's a reason for us to, such as pressure redistribution or needing to absorb moisture or blood. And then we have an ongoing conversation, do we need to take them out early? And then um, even in some cases, the physicians will do a really interesting type of uh, securement so that they can put the dressing in, maybe make it a little bit further away so that somebody can get under. And one of our physicians is actually very famous in our group where he'll take the cut gauze and then he'll put two more cuts in it to make them very skinny and then he 
between the tube and the sutures and then around the sutures on the outside as well. Wonderful. I've seen some of the surgeons do that and I've done that myself for my patients after they've come back from the operating room. Um, I think the next question here might be a little controversial um, because it really depends on uh, each institution's practices. The question is, how often do you change a long-term adult tracheostomy tube? Um, well, I can speak to us um, acknowledging we're in Canada, so I don't know if Health Canada regulations are any different than FDA. Um, all the trachs are regulated for use in Canada. Have, because of the type of device they're um, regulated under, um, the maximum length is 29 days. So we do regularly change our trachs once a month. Um, because we have a very well-functioning trach team in the institution, that happens no problem. We do see quite a few patients who come into us from home that we're getting the trachs um, placed quite as often. And um, not to throw Taher under the bus or anything, but we do have quite a few arguments with our ENT um, <laughs> colleagues. We don't have ENT on house, but we can call them in from our sister sites. And they tend to like to go much longer on trait changes, sometimes two to three months. Um, I haven't really been able to get a good answer, um, especially for us, because cost doesn't come as much into it. Patients aren't paying for it. Um, we don't have to think about the cost as much when we're in hospital, so we do adhere to the monthly trait changes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that because I think according to the FDA, any device that stays in longer than 29 days, it's de defined or called as an implant and tracheostomy tubes are not necessarily manufactured to service implant. Linda, you were also trying to chime in. Uh, do you mind sharing your perspective as well? Yeah, um, here at, uh, at our rehab hospital, we have patients who've had trachs, some of them for only a few weeks and some of them for many years. So we, as a matter of course, we routinely change our adult trachs every four to six weeks and our pediatric trachs every two weeks. But um, when we have patients with um, severe multi-drug multi, um, resistant organisms, we recommend changing them weekly. Mm -hmm. mainly to decrease the biofilm and reintroduce and reinfection, that kind of thing. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Taker, what's your practice in, with the pediatric population? So if they're stable and they've had a trach for a long time, I go two weeks, and otherwise it's once a week for our fresh trach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. I was going to say, you know, sometimes these trachs in the pediatric population are reusable. So Bavona and Shiley allow for you to uh, wash the trach and they have a uh, disinfecting method um, that can allow a trach to be reused up to five times. So with some of our insurance policies or trach resources, depending on, you know, what insurance you have in this country, sometimes the amount of trachs you get per month are not readily accessible. So families are taught in certain situations to be able to disinfect these tracheostomies and they can be reused up to five times. So you, know, you can almost get 10 weeks out of the same trach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it's really interesting to see the variations in practices. And I think um, many of us follow the FDA guidelines and many of them really um, make the decision based on the clinical condition based on each patient's needs as well. Um, the next question here is for Hina. Uh, do you leave the Mepilex silver on the patient for five days or do you change it daily or twice a day? How frequently do you change Mepilex silver? So hospital policy at Texas Children's is to do trait care twice a day and change out the dressing. If they have Mepilex silver in place, we recommend that they only change it if it's soiled within the first five days, but if it's not soiled, to go ahead and lift it to do care underneath, let the site dry, and then replace it. Because we've noticed that the longer it stays in place, the more it, the silver and antibacterial properties are able to kick in and actually be effective. Thank you. Um, and there's a follow-up question, and they want to know who all participated in your multidisciplinary rounds. Um, I think you might have mentioned it, Hina, but if you don't mind just recapping real quick. Sure. So we have the advanced practice provider, which is either a PA or a nurse practitioner. We have an ENT attending physician. 
we have a speech and language pathologist. We have a representative from the respiratory department. We have our inpatient trach coordinator. We have our outpatient trach coordinator. And sometimes we will have any visiting students that may want to join. Thank you. I really want to take this time to thank all the speakers for sharing your perspectives regarding um, wound care management. Um, I am really, really thankful for all of you who are listening as well for taking the time to participate in this discussion. Uh, so here I do have the contacts of each of the speakers. You're welcome to reach out to them directly, or you can also reach out to the GTC um, email or contact, and we'd be happy to connect with the speakers. Um, and I know that um, Linda also wanted to mention that in terms of those of you who want to obtain more information or even purchase TDA, it's available through uh, this website, info at trachecare.net. Um, and so a link to today's webinar will be sent out to you in 10 to 14 days um, after today. And then you're welcome to watch the video from this webinar or also even share it with your colleagues who are unable to attend. Um, our next webinar will be held next year in 2020. More details to come. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy this holiday season with your family and friends. See you all next year.